What if they put somebody in there that says, oh, we need to embrace this. We need to take away capital gains. We need to make it free payment. That changes the whole game. Every large economy like the EU or Japan or all these G7 nations, they all follow in step with the US. Over time, those coins are all going to zero against Bitcoin, even in fiat terms. Fiat is completely worthless. Everything trends to the cost of production. And what is the cost of production to produce a new keyboard stroke, to produce new units? Oh, you want a billion? You want another 10 billion, 100 billion? Click, click, clack. There it is. Is. The cost to produce that is zero. So fiat is worthless toilet paper. You're stealing their time and their life energy through this system. We must resist. It is a question of morals and ethics. 40% of the S&P 500 are the zombie companies. If they didn't have influx of constant debt propping them up and keeping them rolling, they would fail. The implications of sound money on the job markets are so huge. He's made the decision to long fiat, which is the worst trade on planet Earth. You're long pieces of toilet paper literally like with president's dead president's faces on them that's what you're long okay good idea i'm gonna go over here and buy the most scarce digital asset ever created on earth and then you can just keep buying toilet paper <laughs> so what do you think about the the whole election what's your read uh i mean it seems to be a very clear mandate for trump uh so it like it i thought it's closer i mean at least that's what, what we were what we were, what, what we were told right that it will be a close race but it seemed to be not that close uh after all um what this means for bitcoin if if trump really follows through and makes it a um, strategic reserve asset um makes uh favorable sec candidates and fired gary gensler uh maybe lowers or removes taxes on, on on the transaction of course also free ross uh like all those things that he talked about if he follows through with everything that's super for that's great for america i mean it also is great for bitcoin i think for the price action uh but long term it doesn't really matter but it's definitely good for for the states i think uh so what, what's your take on yeah no i agree with everything you just said it's um it like one thing that i've kind of been following is this whole poly market and prediction market movement. I think it's uh, it's a big change. And I think these pollsters have been exposed. I mean, who is going to believe a poll where it says 5149? I mean, when the when the prediction market is clearly showing like over a 15 point lead, you know, or even you can even see today when he got elected, the price of Bitcoin before the final count, Bitcoin surged. So Bitcoin was kind of operating as a prediction market, as well as all these other like, um, you know, poly market and the like. So, yeah, I mean, who's who's controlling these pollsters? You know, obviously there's going to be interest to, to, you know, tilt the scales one way or the other. If I'm a pollster and you're going to pay me a million dollars to to add a couple points, like everybody, not everybody, not Bitcoiners, but a lot of people have a number. You know, and to, to issue a poll of 100 people. And we also don't know how many people are in the poll. I've never been polled. Have you ever been polled? Actually, not. No, like yeah. uh, it's, it's, it's funny <laughs> no. for me to think because, like, I, I've, I mean, I'm young, so I've not voted so much in my life, but it's always like, oh, like, how, how do, they, do they do that? In Austria, actually, they are quite accurate. Like, they usually have um, uh, predictions, and this is actually like, with a small margin of, of error, kind of where, where it's ending, but it's very different because Austria has like those five different parties. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so it's not like a winner takes it all and stuff like that. So right. might be easier. Uh, it's also like popular vote, but yeah, I've never been asked. That's, that's something yeah, never, <laughs> never been asked before. <laughs> Do you know anybody that has been pulled by a pollster? Um, I don't, but I also never asked anyone if they have been polled. So uh, it, I don't know, maybe there is someone that I know that have been polled, but uh, I'm not aware of that. <laughs> yeah, no, me neither. So it begs the question, like, like who, who are these people getting polled? And is it really reflecting what the sentiment at the time is? Or is it like a controlled group? I mean, I'm not, I don't want to get conspiratorial, but it's just funny that I've never been polled. I don't know anybody. You haven't been polled and you don't know anybody. So it's like, maybe they're not capturing, they're not the, capturing total, the total, total population. To, to, to what extent do you think polls can influence the overall, um, the overall election? Well, I think if, uh, if you're, let's say you have a candidate, let's say I wanted to vote for Trump. 
5K. And then I go and I see he has this huge 15 point, let's say, let's make it like really outrageous. He's got like a 25 point lead and I'm like busy at my job and I got kids and I got this going on. It's like, ah, well, he's going to win. I don't need to turn out. Right. But if it's close, then I'm more motivated to be like, look, I got to take time off work. This is really important that I get my vote in. Right. So if you can tilt it one way or the other, you can probably change the turnout. Right. Negatively or positively. I don't, I don't know, but it's much better to have a prediction prediction market that's accurate where people can make their own judgment based on like reality rather than some phony, you know, Hillary Clinton was supposed to win the first, uh, the first election with Trump and that obviously didn't turn out. Um, yeah. So I don't know. It's a very interesting uh, development. I know, I know Marty Bent just recently had a guy that uh, like a Bitcoiner that developed like a prediction market on Bitcoin with sats and stuff. So yeah, who knows if, if, if it shows that it's more accurate than pollsters and, it, and Bitcoin's reflecting maybe some sort of prediction, maybe people will use that more than polls in the future. Who knows? It, it's interesting because um, it's different. Like, uh, for example, if, if you are voting, uh, like you could vote for Kamala Harris, but think that Trump will win. So you would poll and like, oh, like, yeah, I, I, I would vote for Kamala Harris. But then uh, you actually go ahead and, and, and put money uh, on, on Trump because you think he has a better chance of winning. So uh, polls and, and prediction markets, I think, uh, a little bit different, even though they should reflect the same outcome. <laughs> right, because you're um, saying it's more of like a betting more... thing. So people are like, oh, well, that's good odds. Like Trump has good odds, so I'm going to put money on this outcome to make money. So you're, ah, okay, yeah. So it's more like a, it's kind of like a hybrid between like betting odds and polls. So I, yeah, exactly, I don't know. because it, it's it's also like um, you you usually have. Um, like those polls, if if I would conduct the poll, I would try, and I don't know how they conduct it in America, I <laughs> have no clue, but I would try to hit all different geographics and demographics uh, of America uh, and try to get like a, a group from every uh, every demographic. With, with a poly market thing, you have people that have, um, I think it's crypto, uh, cryptos that you can pay. Like there's no fiat uh, thing you can pay with poly market. I think, I don't know. Is, is there, is that a crypto thing actually? Poly market? I never did something with that. I've, I've just downloaded the app and then I follow them on, on X or on Twitter. So I don't really know how it works. I've never actually like placed a wager or a, or a, you know, a bet on anything. So I'm not sure. I have to yeah. dig more into it, but. Yeah, but, but I would guess it's probably screwed towards the younger population and a little bit towards the male population. Uh, True. So that, 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 that can also screw a little bit with that. But in the end, it was way more accurate than, than the post. So. <laughs> right, yeah, it, 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 it was more accurate. So yeah, it, it, it says something. I think it's going to take a lot of... Um, analysis to see how accurate it was and maybe it'll get improved in the future it's just just a very interesting development um in election cycles so It'd be really interesting yeah but yeah we uh, we're here to talk about bitcoin yeah no, it's, <laughs> so uh, it's it's all good. It's, it's really hard to not talk about the election especially like just a few hours after that <laughs> yeah no it's exciting stuff so uh, i mean sorry to to get sidetracked on, on uh, poly market, but yeah, I mean the development for Bitcoin, it's uh, it's going to be a big deal. I mean, what happens when you have um, an administration that's not anti Bitcoin? What happens when you have a pro Bitcoin administration? Like, like you said, they're going to maybe swap out Gary Gensler. What if they put somebody in there that that says, "Oh, we need to embrace this. We need to take away capital gains. We need to make it free payment and like open payment in the U.S." I mean, that changes the whole game, right? And then, you know, every every large economy like, like the EU or Japan or all these G7 nations, they all follow in step with the US, you know? So if, if the US does something, everybody else is, game theory-wise, they're incentivized to, to follow suit. So, yeah, we'll see. It's um, I'm not going to hold my breath on every single promise from from any politician, frankly. So I just hope mainly that he does free Ross on day one. I think that's one of the most important. And then, yeah, if he just has like just decent treatment to Bitcoin and it's going to change the game. So 
Bitcoin's going to do, do it, do what it's going to do regardless. But like you said, are you at all concerned that he puts, um, how should I put it? More crypto people than Bitcoiners in there. Like there, there are some shit coiners all of a sudden uh, saying like, oh yeah, like uh, Ethereum and all the other coins are also commodities and like ha have weird, <laughs> weird, weird things around that. Oh yeah, I mean like he he launched that uh, World Liberty coin or whatever, and you know it, Donald Trump Jr. posts about crypto bullshit all the time, and yeah, I think unfortunately we're gonna have that that lumped in with Bitcoin because people like Trump or Donald Trump Jr. or whoever on his, he has a lot of good Bitcoiners on his team. I want to differentiate from that, but he, some people still haven't made that differentiation between Bitcoin and crypto and they're lumping in it as one. But yeah, I mean, I think over time, those coins are on projects are all going to zero against Bitcoin and even in fiat terms. So yeah. I don't see uh, that slowing down Bitcoin any, but yeah, it's going to be pretty annoying in the next next four years. Yeah, that, that's the only negative that I could think of, like in in terms of Bitcoin and Trump, where I'm like, yeah, he, he has his own <laughs> shitcoin. Uh, maybe he has creates now an opportunity for all the uh, shitcoins to flourish in America. But yeah, you are right. Uh, even if he really incentivized them, um, they will not survive long term against Bitcoin. And this probably actually leads to more adoption of Bitcoin long term because those people that are in crypto eventually see Bitcoin and eventually right. see uh, the Bitcoin education uh, thing. So uh, I think um, uh, it's like uh, a crypto is sometimes even like an entry truck to the to, to Bitcoin. I, I hear that sometimes where people actually come because of some meme coin uh, or e even like a shit coin game in, into into crypto and then they start to educate themselves and then they're like getting old and then they're like getting more experienced and we're like, hey, I should I should also know what this Bitcoin thing is that everyone is talking about. That is the biggest one, and I should probably know about that one. So could could be really good also for Bitcoin. True. Yeah. I mean, I thought it was a really dumb move for his team to come out with this World Liberty coin like right before the election. It's it's crazy because like he came to the Bitcoin conference and just said, "I'm going to fire Gary Gensler." Okay, and then right after launches a shitcoin project. <laughs> It's like, okay, you just open yourself up for like a charge, you know, for like a unregistered, launching an unregistered security. Like Gary Gensler could just like, okay, here's an indictment or whatever. Like so dumb. Like the risk reward was just ridiculous. Like, and then they, then they would have started with Trump's a criminal and look, he's going back to court. And I mean, I don't understand why Gary Gensler didn't. It's very frustrating for me that all these, these uh, shit coins don't get, don't get prosecuted. I don't understand why they don't, but it was especially obvious when Trump does it. And then the guy that's supposed to be charging him gets insulted and is like, I'm going to, he's going to basically get fired. And then he still didn't press charges. So it's like, is the crypto stuff going to stop anytime soon? I would love for it to, but it just doesn't seem like there's any, anybody, any uh, demand for, for slowing it down, unfortunately. <sighs> It's 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 for me uh, interesting when we look at that because it seems like the same conversation with with fiat in general. Like the, when I ask people, oh, like wh when are we getting rid of, of fiat and when we, when are we getting rid of altcoins? Uh, usually the answer is is <laughs> quite similar. Like the, you, know, you, you could even like exchange the answers sometimes where like yeah, like uh, the, the we, we know it's garbage, but we also know that the people will stick to that garbage for. <laughs> A little longer and uh yeah fiat has an, a massive network effect uh, in addition to that uh, which uh, altcoins don't have a network effect at all i think and uh, not a, a significant at least maybe it's ethereum a little bit uh but yeah they they <laughs> it's sometimes the, the same answer to that question uh fiat and crypto and I, I actually put it in the same category um because it's like a, a centrally uh, issued token in the end of the day and that's what crypto is and that's what fiat is. Yeah. yeah, fiat is a shit coin, and I mean, this is my this is my handle name. Like, fiat is worthless. Fiat is completely that worthless. Is Ultimately, everything trends to the cost of production, and what is the cost of production to produce a new 
keyboard keyboard stroke to produce new units. Oh, you want a billion? You want another 10 billion, 100 billion? Click, click, clack. There it is. So ultimately, the cost to produce that is zero. So fiat is worthless toilet paper. And that was like a big... Uh, a big orange pill moment for me when I realized that it's just like, Oh, okay. So I'm getting paid in something somebody else can print. Like that's, blew that, my mind. that's a huge one. Yeah. Blew my mind. And, uh, I haven't looked back since. So as soon as I get that fiat hit my account for my job, it just gets turned into Bitcoin. So yeah, you can pay me in the toilet paper, but it's going straight into Bitcoin. So that's where I, I choose to save, save my, uh, my time and labor. By the way, that's a really good orange pilling question. Ask someone, um, why are you working for something someone else can just print? Someone else can just issue for themselves and you have to earn that and put your energy in there. And someone else is like, oh yeah, I, I, I just issue more. <laughs> right. Like that's a great, great orange pill. Or you could even flip it. Like if I sat at home and I had, and I was counterfeiting money, is that moral? Is that ethical? Well, no, obviously, like nobody can can like counterfeit money because that's unfair because that you could just like, you know, spend that money and then prices of everything would go up and it would be so unfair. And it's like, well, that's what's going on from our central bank. Like that's literally what's going on from our central bank, our, our commercial banks, our central bank and the, and the government are all in collusion. They all know the game. And they're all just printing and counterfeiting money. And then we're forced to use it. So not anymore. We have this new thing <laughs> called Bitcoin. That, Bitcoin. I, I never thought about that. It's like when, when, when the government is doing something uh, that would be illegal if uh, a regular citizen does it, that's usually not okay. Like... <laughs> <laughs> like if, if 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 the government is printing money uh then uh the people should also be able to print money otherwise either printing money like <laughs> never thought about that perspective uh the the moment the government is doing something that when a normal citizen does it is illegal the government also should not do that, that that's basically the, the thing I, I just thought about I, I never had that mind switch of like uh i i should do what the government is also uh doing and yeah Oh, I saw, sorry for, for no, that. It's okay. It's mind, mind blowing. blowing. <laughs> it is mind blowing. A hundred percent. I have the same feeling. It's like if, you know, there's been a lot of heinous things done in the world that were legal, it doesn't make, make them ethical. So if there's something that's happening, such as counterfeiting money, aren't we ab obligated to resist that? We're obligated at, as ethical and moral human beings to not accept that system. Because we we know we now know that it harms others. You're stealing their time and their life energy through this system. So we must resist. Is a, it is a question of morals and ethics. Period. Full stop. Full stop. Like that's why we're so passionate about Bitcoin because it's you know somebody can work their whole life and unless they understand that they're supposed to work for dollars or euros and then when they get that. They're supposed to convert it and quote unquote invest and put that money at risk in order to just either survive or thrive in the society. Nobody tells us in public school or on the news that we need to be actually investing our money or else we're getting stolen from. Right. So it's, it's, a, it's an insidious sick system that, no, that we're all not being educated on and it's unethical. So it is, it is worthless. And, and on top of being unethical, it also produces a lot of inefficiencies. Like the, you, you just dump money so much on, on, on the, uh, on the people that everywhere those small inefficiencies and weird business model come up that should not uh, even be there. And yeah. And I mean, this is maybe a good segue into like my thread because now you have like all of these companies that are, that are basically being propped up with debt, right? You have companies taking on debt to buy back their own stock, to keep their stock price going up. And they're getting interest rates at a far lower interest rate than you and I. If I go take out a loan, a personal loan, it's like 9%. If they go take out a loan, it's like less than 1% of what 
okay, great. So they just like keep rolling over debt on a big, huge corporation because they have a relationship with their commercial and central bank. So yeah, there's a lot of companies. I've heard the I've heard numbers like forty percent of the S and P five hundred are are kind of zombie companies. Like if they didn't have like influx of constant debt propping them up and keeping them rolling, they would fail. I don't know if that number is true. That just pops in my mind. I can't, don't quote me on that, but yeah, it's pretty sick. So you, inside those co- zombie companies, not only you have the company that's, that shouldn't exist, you have all of these people working a job that's not productive for society on like on net, right? So you're kind of like trapping all of these people and these unproductive companies and these unproductive roles. What happens when the money printer shuts off, those businesses fail and all of those employees go find something they're passionate about, something that they're, that actually provides value to society. I think it changes the world. Mm, I've had that's, that's so beautiful. Uh, and I've, I, I, it's seen more and more where you have a lot of um, employees that just um, organize some Excel sheets. <laughs> right. <laughs> they, yeah. They, show, yeah. They, they just move things from one thing to another thing. And the implications of sound money on the job markets are so huge. And I really want to break that down with, with, with you. Um, maybe quickly before that um monetary premium is something that i want to touch on a little bit before that sure uh, we talked about zombie companies how they have a lot of monetary premium in them we have obviously other assets like all the assets like real estate even gold and something like that that have a lot of um monetary premium in them um, because the central banks are just like putting money in the system and then people have to figure out what to do with that money and have to like, uh, put it everywhere just so to be diversified and, and, and safe. Um, what happens if we now have that one perfect monetary system where, for example, like me am 100% in there, I don't have real estate. I don't hold other, other assets like that. What happens to those things? Uh, do you imagine that? That actually the whole monetary premium of all the assets uh, come to Bitcoin or is it more like a hybrid where most of that comes to Bitcoin but there will also be monetary premium in, in other assets in, in, in companies in gold maybe in real estate and stuff like that yeah so I think the way the way that I think about it it's there's two things in an asset like take a house for example you have monetary premium but before that you have utility obviously, right? So you have a house, it's, it performs a duty, it's a tool, it's a place to live. It's also money, right? Because then it's, it's, there's a level of scarcity with real estate that the scarcity of real estate is, is more scarce than the money because the money is infinite, right? So that's where the, the monetary premium is appearing, right? So then instead of it being a house and a place to live, it turns into a form of money for people. Right. So people are buying houses. I know people, I'm, I'm from Canada. It's like probably the biggest housing. Well, maybe not the biggest China's up there, but one of the biggest housing bubbles on earth, in my opinion, everybody I know back home has, Oh, I have two rental apartments. Oh, I just bought a strip mall. It's like all these people. It's like, aren't you like a, a farmer? It's like, yeah, well, I'm in, I'm, I also own commercial real estate. It's like, they're not actually taking their capital and, and using it for farming or being a pharmacist or a dentist or whatever. They're like also, also in real estate because they're forced to. Right. So I think what, what could happen is that that monetary premium could fall off of real estate, but you'll always have a utility value. And then that would be priced in Bitcoin. Right. So housing will fall in Bitcoin terms to its cost of production plus its utility value. That's going to that's going to find some sort of medium, right? A house will be worth something. A, a beautiful view over the ocean is worth something. Someone's a roof over your head is worth something. So, yeah, I think the monetary premium will fall. I'm not investing in real estate. You're not investing in real estate. I mean, if that trend just continues over and over again, do I want a second house, maybe a summer house someday? Maybe. Do I want a nice piece piece of land with a house by a lake? Yeah, but it doesn't mean it's my investment. That's a big differentiator in my mind. 
Absolutely. If we can buy for a fraction of a uh, Bitcoin, a nice summer house, maybe. <laughs> yeah, no, exactly. I think, I think it's trending to that. I mean, you look, you look at um, one of my favorite websites in, uh, in Bitcoin is priced in Bitcoin 21.com. Have you been to this website before? Oh yes, I oh, actually yes. pull it up. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I actually pull it up a lot on the, on, 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 the, on, the, on the podcast. That's why I say, oh yes, yeah, it's so good. <laughs> but but uh, it's it's. I mean, now obviously, I, I didn't pull it up uh, since we hit the all-time high because we are quite high actually right now. So it has to be look look really really uh, nice right yeah. now, really really red. <laughs> yeah, so good. Just so a sea good. of red. So. Anybody that hasn't seen this website before, maybe I'll just explain it quickly. So like what, what this is doing is it's pricing, I mean, commodities, goods, services, I mean, from crude oil, Pro natural yeah. gas, gold, silver, uh, different fiat currencies, agricultural commodities like beef and eggs, everything's beef being- is, beef, is the, beef is the first screen one uh, on the screen. Sorry to under interrupt. <laughs> okay, well, bad example. <laughs> But uh, you, okay, one out of like a hundred is green. But what it's what this chart is saying that when pri pricing eggs in Bitcoin, the the price in Bitcoin is falling. So it's o year over year. So it's like on the day, on the week, on the month, on the year. What's the percentage change? And if it's in red, then it's the price is down, right? So. Yeah, my favorite one is the median house. Yes, exactly. You're two steps ahead. You're uh, you're good at this. So um, yeah, over five years, we're showing that Bitcoin, the price of of a house when priced in Bitcoin is is falling, right? So it used to cost whatever 150 Bitcoin to buy a house. Now it costs like 10 Bitcoin or whatever it is. So if you've priced that same house in fiat, it's like oh, the house went from three hundred thousand dollars to five hundred thousand dollars it went up it's like when you switch o switch over to the bitcoin world you start pricing everything in bitcoin and it's like well why is it falling don't don't houses always go up forever it's like no they don't we get better at building houses we get, get more efficient at getting the materials for houses you know we're using technology to build houses better faster stronger and uh and it's it's yeah. fascinating to see when you have uh five years ago a uh, new house uh, uh is priced at like 44 bitcoin uh that's like december 1st uh 2019 and now five years later uh it's it's like five bitcoin right now 5.8 bitcoin a, a new average or median house actually uh that's that's a crazy crazy thing and you have to keep in mind the houses are going up in US dollars um, and people that hold held houses over the last five years, they probably feel really clever. They really feel smart of doing that because their net worth measured in US dollar has gone up significantly. But then they don't realize that they don't get more. They actually fall, like they're looking at a hill that is growing and growing, but they don't realize that they actually fall down. And that's the only reason why the hill is growing because they fall actually right. further down. It's perspective. And yeah. Wow. Good point. It's, Good point. It's, it's a perspective. And when, once you switch the whole perspective to the Bitcoin, it, it just, it just gives you a lot of, lot of, um, value for your time in, in Bitcoin terms already. Like it, it's like that, that mind shift, uh, switch of like, Oh, I should value my time in Bitcoin, in Satoshis and not uh, in US dollars and not in anything else. Then all of a sudden you value your time more and you make, uh, I think also better life decisions, but that's another tangent. hundred <laughs> percent. And like the way I've been kind of thinking lately is when you look at a price, really it is a, it is a ratio. It is a, it is a pair, like a trade. Think of it like a trading pair. It's like how many cars priced in chair, how many chairs buys a car, right? It's like, oh, like a hundred, I don't know how many chairs buys a car, but maybe bad example. But what it boils down to is, is the price going of, of cars going up in chairs or going down? Well, chairs are less scarce and easier to make than the car. Right. So the trend, because whatever's more scarce, it will, it will go 
up in, right? So if we take Bitcoin, for example, it's like, oh, well, the price is going up. It's like, okay, Bitcoin is, is fixed. It is a finite amount, right? It is, it is scarce and fixed. It's just more scarce than what it's being priced in, right? So it's not that Bitcoin's going up. It's because fiat is going down. The game of scarcity. So real estate is more scarce than fiat. That's why it goes up all the time. I partnered up with Coin Vigilante. This is the most beautiful Bitcoin timepiece that I ever saw created by anyone. Look at that beauty. I love it so much. Coin Vigilante made a perfect Bitcoin watch. That's the perfect, subtle, elegant way to go out there and show that you are a Bitcoiner. And that watch brand is Bitcoin only. And Coin Vigilante just dropped a completely new and amazing Genesis edition of their watch collections. You have the date of the first ever mined Bitcoin block in there and of course also the block height and which epoch we are currently in. I love the level of detail they put in in this masterpiece and make sure to check out those amazing coin vigilante timepieces down in the descriptions. I love those watches so so much. If you watch or listen to my podcast on a regular basis I guess you already bought some Bitcoin and now the most important step is to keep the Bitcoin, keep them secure in a hardware wallet. My personal recommendation for hardware wallet is the Bitbox. It's super secure. It's simple to set up. It's also a perfect gift for a friend who has still the Bitcoin on an exchange. And you can get a 5% discount with the code Robin at the checkout. Visit bitbox.swiss Robin to get your Bitbox. And the next step is to really level up your sovereignty as an individual. You have to have the most secure self-custody setup. You have to secure your own devices. You have to protect your privacy. You have to set up an inheritance plan. And depending on where you live, you even want to have a plan B, a citizenship where you can move in case something goes really, really wrong. And through all those steps, the Bitcoin way is guiding you through step by step. And if you visit the bitcoinway.com slash partners slash Robin, you even get a 30 minute free call to find out how you can level up your sovereignty. It's, it's also interesting for me um, because a lot of people don't realize that a, a not financial decision is also a financial decision. Uh, and I think that that, that example give, it gives a little bit perspective on that because you have to uh, care for your financial situation if you want or not. Uh, I had recently a discussion with someone, uh, on, on like, um, Sunday morning brunch where a, lot, a bunch of friends were, uh, collected and there was a new guy and I talked to him and he's like, Oh no, I'm not comfortable, um, investing my money. And I was like, don't you have money? And he's like, yeah, yeah I have my money, but I'll uh, keep it on my bank account. And I, and I was like to him, you realize that that is investing. <laughs> like right. you keeping your money in euros on your bank account, that's a financial decision. That's investing. You are betting on that uh, yeah. in three, four, five, 20, 50 years from now, that euro is still there. But so many people don't realize that even, even if they don't do a decision, they make a decision. Even if, only if they don't have any money at all. Uh, but that's then a different uh, topic. But that's actually where we come to the job threads that you then uh, posted. Uh, but yeah, it's uh, you, you cannot make no financial decision, if, if you know what I mean. Yeah, he's long fiat. He's made the decision to long fiat, which is the worst trade on planet Earth, right? You're, you're long pieces of toilet paper. <laughs> Literally, like with presidents, with presidents, dead presidents' faces on them. That's what you're long. Okay, good idea. I'm going to go over here and, and buy the most scarce digital asset ever created on Earth. I'll just like stay here, and then you can just keep buying toilet paper. Same, same thing. <laughs> like, I love it. So what a much. joke. <laughs> 
Um, one thing that you mentioned that I just see as a pattern, uh, and maybe it fits also in the in the topic with uh, with America. Um, you uh, said you are right now not in in Canada, but you are originally from from Canada. Um, I see it with so many Canadians that they are no longer in ca Canada and they flee from from Canada. Um, how, how do you see the the um, the, the nation right now there, and and why did you Uh, go away from there or are you uh, are you going back or like how was your plan yeah well my situation I've uh, you know I didn't flee because of for political reasons I do think it's a clown show at the moment but we can get into that um, the reason why I left is my my wife is Swedish so I was traveling actually met my my wife in Riga Latvia and uh, I was like backpacking through there before I even knew about honey badger and Bitcoin and all that stuff. I was, I just was backpacking through there and I met her uh, eight years ago and uh, now we're, now we're married. So um, yeah, now, now we live in Sweden. We're based, uh, based in Southern Sweden. So um, that's the reason why I left. Um, I guess I can just start kind of with my whole, my whole story um, that happened in, I met my wife in 2016 I moved to uh, Sweden in December 2019, right before the COVID thing uh, went down. So uh, I was working before that uh, for about six years in the Canadian oil sands, kind of like construction management, m mining, whatever, pipelining kind of kind of roles. Um, I studied like construction engineering tech as a program. So I, when I moved to Sweden, there's no oil. I mean, there's no oil fields in Sweden. They're pretty, pretty much anti oil and gas. So I had to, you know, find a new job and get settled. And, and that's right. Very inconveniently right before COVID struck. So I was unemployed and then COVID started happening and I'm like job hunting. And of course, everything just like nobody's hiring in COVID. I mean, right in the beginning of COVID, like the world's about to end and I'm like looking for a job. Right. So in a field that doesn't really exist in Sweden. So big disadvantage. Um, so, yeah, I mean, before when I used to go to like job hunting, I would just like, oh, yeah, somebody I know or I'd go like, you know, print off my resume or my CV and hand it out. And that, I got got work that way kind of through word of mouth. But I don't I didn't know anybody. And I'm in an industry that I in a country that I don't know. So, um What I'd started to do is I started to do what I always did. Just, okay, just start. I printed off a bunch of CVs, put them in my backpack. I was literally walking on the construction sites and saying, hey, like, I'm looking for a job. And they're like, first of all, I'm speaking English. And they're like, kind of like, well, what are you doing here? Get away from me. And then somebody said after maybe 10, 10 construction sites, they're like, just apply online. Like, apply online. Like, everybody's like, apply online. It's like, okay, so I have to apply online. So, you know, first thing you do is you go on like monster.com or jobs.com or like the company, ABC company, and like check their job listings. You know, none of them have the job that I want that are posted. They don't have any job listings or I'm like searching through them. And then when you go to find a job that you want, there's like 400 applicants, right? So you apply for the job and then you don't hear back from them and they, they need a personal letter and all this BS, right? So I uh, I probably applied for I did, I wish I would have counted but I probably applied for like three or four hundred jobs during COVID, right? So I mean I'm desperate. I I spent ten months unemployed. Like all my like my a lot not all my savings but a lot of my savings was going nowhere. I'm just unemployed, sitting at home in COVID, no job, no support. You know, because I just recently moved there, so there was no unemployment benefits or anything. I'm expected to support myself and. My wife is technically expected to support me, but, uh, you know, I'm going through my savings. And uh, so anyway, I start this journey of, of how to find work. And I mean, I think this is really important in this time uh, because uh, if you are a person who is a Bitcoiner and you want to stack Bitcoin, you have to have a positive in income. You have to be a net producer. You can't be living paycheck to paycheck and stack Bitcoin. It doesn't work that way. Right. I mean, You know this too, right? You need to have money left over at the end of the month to stack. So um, 
I think this is my, this whole process that I went on is hopefully going to help somebody. That's kind of the goal of this whole podcast. Anyway, um, sorry if I'm rambling, but, um, I started to figure out my way on how to, how to, to get a job. I figured out that when you apply for a job, let's say it's like on LinkedIn and it's a project manager job, for example, when you apply, you send your, they ask for a personal letter and a CV. Okay. So you fill out, Oh, I'm the greatest person on earth. And this is going to be perfect. This is my dream job, blah, blah, blah. And then you fill out your, your CV and you make like, it's like you fill out your CV and you submit it online and then you don't hear back. Right. It's like, okay. Or, Oh, sorry, sorry to, sorry to inform you that, you know, your application has been denied or whatever. So that obviously doesn't work. Then I started looking on YouTube. It's like, okay, why am I not getting any calls back? And I found out um, through this account on YouTube about the ATS system. Have you heard about this before? Uh, no, I mean, I read it in your thread, but I have no clue what it is. Yeah, so the, the ATS system is the applicant tracking system. So essentially what it is, is it's like a software program that these companies use to filter CVs and personal letters. So it'll take your personal letter and your CV, and then it'll just, it'll compare just the text and the words versus the text, the, the words in the job posting. And like, let's say I said project manager 10 times in my CV, and then the job posting had is, was for a project manager, I would be, you know, a, a, a match for the role. It's not about like whether I'm good for the role or my experience is good. It's literally just a keyword match. And then it goes and compiles like a top 10 or a top five candidates list. And then the hiring agent at the company, like an HR rep gets, gets a, a top five and then they just read those top five. So if, if you're applying for a job and you're like one of 200 people applying for the job, you've likely been filtered out before anybody's even read your CV and your personal letter that you wrote, right? You wrote like this passionate CV uh, personal letter and it was just, it just got filtered out by some, some software. So um, I found that out. And what it, the next thing I think is like, okay, well, I need to, to, to match my CV and my personal letter versus this job posting. So I went and I figured out, okay, if I want to get a project manager job, I'm going to put project manager <laughs> a lot of times in my CV and a lot of times in all the different keywords like construction and, and supervisor and scheduling and all these keywords that match the job posting. I submit, I started applying that way. Still nothing. What am I doing wrong? So funny story. I, I, I thought to myself, okay, what I'll do is I'll copy the job posting, copy the text, paste it into my CV, turn it white, white font. So you can't see it, shrink it down to like one font, put it in the footer of the CV. And then when the ATS system scans it, I'll be a hundred percent match. <laughs> so then I started submitting CVs with a hundred percent match, right? I should be at the top of the list if I have exactly all the keywords in my CV. Then I found out if you're a hundred percent match, it kicks you out too. You can't be a hundred percent. You have to be like a 90, 99% match or else the system sees that you game the system and spits you out. So it's like, I'm trying to figure all this out. And you know how Bitcoiners, we go right to the bottom of something. Like I think Bitcoiners are so relentless in our pursuit for the truth that we just go right to the bottom of this. And I was obviously motivated to find work. So I said, okay, this isn't working. I'm not getting any traction. Okay. So I started going on LinkedIn because they had, somebody had told me, oh, the whole game's on LinkedIn. Okay. So I like look at the job postings on the job section of LinkedIn and I started applying for those. And then it dawned on me, I've seen like a few people like in the suggestions, like recruiter, there's people that are recruiters or headhunters. I was like, okay. So I just started saying like construction, recruiter, project management, headhunter, staffing, wind, wind energy, staffing, wind energy, recruiter. And I just did that over and over and over again. Probably I remember sitting like full days, just like pounding the keys to find, okay, who are the people that do these recruitment jobs? And maybe they can help me. And I found out that not only is it people, there are full, like full uh, recruiting companies 
that ha that hire consultants to find to fill roles for projects. So, I'll give you an example. Like, let's say you want to build um, a wind farm in Austria, for example. ABC company says, okay, we need to have two project managers, uh, three supervisors, three admins, four uh, foremen, technicians, blah blah blah, and that company doesn't want to go and do all that work by themselves. So they subcontract that out. They do it in-house. So they just say, oh, okay, ABC recruitment company, fill these roles for us in the best way and and then let us know who the people are going to be on the project, right? So these recruitment companies develop these uh, relationships with large large companies to for the reason of filling the role. So those jobs, they don't ever see like monster.com. They don't ever see LinkedIn jobs page. Like they already, the rec rec recruitment company already has a list and then they're going out and filling the roles like through headhunting with their consultants. So they'll contact people on LinkedIn themselves. So if you don't know that this is going on and you're looking for a project management role and you're just like applying online to these, these other jobs, which I must, I must have one little caveat. If there is a role on LinkedIn job section, for example, a lot of times, let's say uh, ABC company wants to have a project manager, needs a project manager, and they already have a candidate within their company that they want to fill the role. They can't just go in, in, like a lot of times they can't just, just hire, like do an inside hire. You know, if they, like if they had laid off a project manager and then they want to replace that guy with John Smith that's already works for the company, why did you lay that guy off it's saying there's like no work for him and then just go and replace him with somebody else? Like you're kind of putting yourself at risk with the regulators. So what they'll do is they'll take that project management role and they'll post it for a month on monster.com or LinkedIn job section. So then they'll say, okay, we actually didn't do it, like want to have an inside hire. We posted it in the public, but then after a month, then the be we found the best candidate was actually John Smith from our company. So it's a way for them to get around the liability of, of doing an inside hire. So that job's already filled and dummy, like a dummy like me who didn't know the system, how the system worked, I'm applying for that job and that job's already been filled. So, yeah, that's why you also see them online and, you don't, and, and a lot of people don't get traction because those, those, are, those jobs are gone. So once I figured this out, I'm like, ah, okay. So then I started like finding, okay, who, is, who are the recruiting companies within my industry? I added all the companies on LinkedIn. Who are the people that work at all these companies? I connected with all the people from each company. And then once I connected with all of them, I DM'd them all and made a relationship with them. And then I set up phone calls with all, well, not all of them, but whichever ones wanted to re respond back to me, I set up phone calls and built a relationship with all of them and sent them my CV. So if, once I started doing this, I went from like getting zero traction to, I had like three interviews the first week, three interviews the second week. And then I, I don't think I lasted three weeks without getting a job. And it was like, boom, 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 boom. It just like people were me like emailing me and messaging me with offers and, and job roles that would be perfect for me. And like, because they're incentivized to find me a role. All these consultants get paid by the company when the role is filled, right? So we talk about incentives a lot in Bitcoin. They're all incentivized to find me a job. It works, right? All of a sudden I have a job. When nobody is incentivized to give me a job, then nobody gives me a job and it's not, I'm not making excuses for myself. Maybe there's roles that I wasn't fit for or whatever, but I'm just saying in general, you, I followed the incentives and they worked. So sorry, I've been rambling, yeah. but it's very interesting. No, 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 that's really, really cool. Um, and I think I, I never really <laughs> had to search for a job because my first job that I was six years in, uh, I found in school and there was like a program and, and there oh, yeah. I, I met the CEO. So like that was kind of uh, nice. What did you do outside, did you of, Bitcoin? Do outside of Bitcoin? Uh, before Bitcoin, I was uh, starting there as next to school as a software tester. Then this was too boring and I said, hey, I want to 
program actually so i was a software developer and then actually i was like hey i want to have more uh contact with my clients uh with, with the clients of the company mm -hmm. and then i got into um a managed service and then i got into sales uh and then in the end i was having my own clients at the company plus was working very closely with the ceo so i had uh, had a had actually a quite nice career in in, in that and I, I was feeling very good also in the company the only reason i left was i want to do something with bitcoin yeah <laughs> that, that, that's literally the only reason i, I felt very good there uh, everyone treated me good i had a lot of growth potential i grew also a lot there uh, i got a lot of knowledge there so it was really cool uh other than it was it security and not bitcoin and I just, I just like Bitcoin so much more. But I know from uh, my girlfriend, she's coming from India, and then she was only two years here when she started uh, the the job hunt, or three years here mm -hmm. when she started the job hunt, and she didn't knew German in Austria, and in Austria, German is very important for companies. Oh yeah, uh, very traditional. You like you have to speak German with us, mm -hmm. uh, and she started that job hunt um and it was not that easy but she actually found in a reasonable time i think like in four months something like that uh, a job actually through linkedin which surprised me that it actually worked but it was a startup uh and uh it, it is a startup i mean now they're kind of crew so it's not that startup anymore uh but and they have english as their main default language because they hire so many from other countries also uh and that was a perfect fit uh but it, i i saw the struggle like you have uh, the recruiting companies uh, you have to really uh find connections you have to build connections it's not a oh yeah i i turn I, i'm not actively searching for a job and then all of a sudden jobs turn up and you apply and you, you get hired like you, you really have to build the connections and you have to lead up to that uh and and uh, in the end of the day uh it's 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 quality and quantity like you have to uh not like put everything on like w one company and like yeah hopefully it goes good uh but you also have to do um the the, the quality uh of the application but I have no clue, uh, like in, in a broader sense of application, it's just like my experience that I experienced with her, uh, find, finding a job in Austria. Um, but your way seems the, the best one. You build uh, relationships and you use the incentive uh, of recruiters. And also uh, a friend of mine actually does that in Austria. He founded a, a company a year ago and he is a recruiting company because he has a lot of uh, motivated people in, in his network and, and he had the, the connections also to a lot of companies and he, he does that now since a year. Uh, so I got a little bit of... Um, a little bit of... Uh, insights into that industry so that's why i was also really intrigued when you uh, told me that you want to uh, talk about that on the podcast i was like that's super interesting and then also the the question next to that is like how will that change into bitcoin uh when we are really incentivized to find the best candidates with a high value proposition like how how will that whole um um job searching and job market change through bitcoin that's what i'm also really interested in. what would you have to say about that yeah um yeah it's a great question i first i want to like touch on what you said earlier about where you went from um and this is relevant so when you went from your software role and then you just entered bitcoin how did you evaluate the opportunity cost of staying at your software software job versus just diving into Bitcoin because I'm actually, I've started a sub stack. It's one of my new, I haven't posted anything yet, but I've been writing some articles and one of them is on opportunity cost. So the, I've been having a struggle myself. Like I really want to work in Bitcoin. I'm just an average pleb. I'm obsessed with Bitcoin. I'm on a spreadsheet every day. Like you said, like doing something I don't particularly like listening to Bitcoin podcasts and stuff, but I always struggle with the opportunity costs and I'll, and I'll tell you what, you, what I mean. So if whatever, if I'm making a hundred thousand a year, for example, right. And I'm able to be on that wage, hundred thousand dollars, let's say, for example, if I'm able to be like cash flow positive at the end of the month and stack, then that suits like the, the, the Bitcoin plebs journey. Like 
we're stacking sats, we're stacking sats. If I wanted to, let's say I wanted to become a developer or something, maybe that's a bad example, but if I wanted to go to university for the next four years and get like a software engineering degree, computer science engineer, computer science degree, let's say it's like $200,000 or $100,000, four years of lost wages. And then whether I'm able to get a job that pays a decent wage in order to stack SATs in, in four years, that's going to come at a hefty price in Bitcoin terms, right? Because right now, let's say on a person's earning $100,000, they're able to stack, I don't know how much you can stack, let's say 5% of that per year. In the future, even if you get a better job as a software en engineer for like $200,000, you're not going to be able to stack as much Bitcoin in the future because $200,000 is going to be a better wage in fiat, but priced in Bitcoin, you're going to be earning less Bitcoin per year. Do you know what I mean? So it's like, I understand if you have enough Bitcoin and it's like a passion thing and you, you feel comfortable with the amount that you have, but I, I don't, I feel like I want to stack more. So I'm kind of like in this uh, golden handcuff scenario. How do you, how do you think about that? Uh, that's a super interesting question. Uh, something that I don't talk a lot on the podcast, actually. Um, first of all, for me, I really wanted to start something myself. Like n it was not only working in IT security versus working in Bitcoin. It was also for me um, how I want to work. I, I really wanted to build something that's mine. Like I had this dream of like having my own thing. I wasn't sure what my thing is, <laughs> yeah. but I was always like, I, I want to have my own thing. Um, so that was my dream. And I had the stream the first time in 2020. Uh, and I started in 2020, actually, uh, a stock <laughs> podcast and the stock YouTube channel, uh, where I talked about Tesla, Apple, Facebook. So like okay. all those, those companies. And I also was invested in them, uh, since like a few years before I started that YouTube channel. So I had that massive dream of mine, but then, uh, I also had the job next to it. The job got from a, a part-time job next to school and university, uh, more and more and more. And the funny thing that happened is then I forgot about that dream <laughs> because, uh, the salary was good and they paid me and it was comfortable. Uh, and, um, there's a saying, a salary is the truck to give you to forget about your dreams. Exactly. And exactly. This was extremely true for me because I actually forgot about it. Like 2020, uh, I was super, super motivated to do that. And then reality set in, um, then yeah, got a good salary, got a good work environment. Uh, that, that I, I didn't have a bad boss. I had actually had a very good one. Uh, I had no bad colleagues. I actually had very nice and good colleagues, which, uh, I even met outside. Now, uh, I even met them, uh, a few months after I quit, uh, I still meet them, uh, sometimes. So like it was it's actually a good relationship also. Uh, and I got a company car and, and, and things like that. Wow. So like a lot of benefits, uh, which is all good. Mm -hmm. Um, but this, the stream didn't completely went away because then in 2023, uh, I got into Twitter and I was just like, okay, I have my job. That's my main thing, but I also want to have my, like my passion project. It will be always a hobby project. And I just like tweet and connect with Bitcoiners because Bitcoin at that time, at that time, I also switched from stocks to completely all in Bitcoin. Um, and then it went completely all in Bitcoin, uh, and went into Twitter. And I was like, okay, if I want to do it, I want to do it at least with, um, some commitment. Mm -hmm. So I committed in 2023, in the beginning to do five tweets per day. That was my only commitment out, uh, for Bitcoin in that community. And that commitment took me from like 200 followers and nobody knows me to 7,000 followers to some people have seen my tweets. Uh, that, that was basically 2023. And I put two to four hours every day in that, like every day 
two to four hours just tweeting. I did not see that as work because it was really feeling good. Right. <laughs> I really it's liked it. Yeah. <laughs> it. It's a lot of fun. And then I wanted to have like also video format. And that then I just like started with with a video format, uh, making short content, making longer content, making news content. And then uh, I remembered about that podcast that really felt meaningful that I started in 2020. And I was like, maybe maybe I should start that again uh, with Bitcoin now. Uh, and yeah, in November 20, uh, the 28th of November 2023, so last year, so almost now a, a year ago, um, I started the podcast with my first episode and that felt really good. That felt amazing. I, I, I really loved it. And I got to talk with, uh, I think in, in December, uh, already with Jeff Booth, like just a month later. Wow. And all, all those um, developments were like, what? Like that, that feels really good. I, I found something that I actually like, but I didn't make any money with that. Yeah, whatever, whatever. I'm talking to Jeff Booth. I don't Jeff care. Booth, I'll do it for free. <laughs> exactly. And um, there's a saying like, once you see the grass on the other side of the garden, like mm. once you see the green grass on your neighbor, you really feel bad about your bad grass. Oh. So uh, I, I saw the, I saw the, amazing opportunity that the podcast has and then all of a sudden um i not i, I got uh from twitter my first paycheck actually on christmas eve i got the got the message from twitter that i um apply to have those five million impressions of what you need for that and that you will get your first paycheck in like two weeks time something like that uh, i got that actually on christmas eve and i was like wow, wow cool uh i didn't knew how much it was uh and that was like researching and i was like ah probably not that much uh it ended up being like 300 euros something like that wow. it was definitely not bad uh but it was i was also aware that was that was just the first one and then the next ones are uh lower and it was like that and it's still like that like i get from twitter i think 50 or 100 euros every two weeks so not something i can um support myself on uh but then i was like okay but i get money for random shit posts <laughs> on some random <laughs> platform maybe the meaningful long conversation on youtube and on podcast platforms is also worth something so i reached out to 21 bitcoin uh and i was like hey do you want to be my sponsor and they said yes and they set up a contract with me and they said hey let's let's do that thing and now i'm not working with them anymore <laughs> because i had an english podcast and they all only operate in the German speaking area. Uh, so that long term obviously did not turn out, but they gave me the signal um, that uh, I already had the second income stream because of them. And then I was like, okay, then I have revenue. I have a passion. I'm young. Let's do that shit. Yeah. Yeah. Let's go. <laughs> and, and, and I, I told you how uh, I liked my, my job and that was the hardest decision ever. Right. Like I was pondering about that decision a whole month, like four weeks or three weeks straight. I was thinking uh, in the morning, in the afternoon, in the night, I could not sleep nice. I cried multiple times. I cried multiple times of like, what the heck should I do? Should I quit my job? Should I go into uh, this new thing that I have no clue if this even turns out? Like I, I have no experience in marketing. Like right. <laughs> I'm, I'm a software developer by trade. So like, I have no clue what I'm doing here. I just, I'm good with computers. So I was like, technically I will can set it up, but uh, I have no clue what I was doing. So very long answer to your question. Oh, great but now, I'm, <laughs> now I'm right here at that moment where I'm like, um, what do I do? three weeks completely like pondering um I, I was talking with my girlfriend i was talking to uh, my dad i was talking to uh, um, people at the company uh not my boss just like uh, employees and tell them told them please don't say anything but i have to have this uh possibility and the interesting part the more and more i talked with people i realized i have to do that i i will i will not forgive me give myself the whole life if i'm not doing that if if i do that and fail that's, that's okay. okay you can, you can <laughs> that, live with that. that i tried at least i tried 
Yeah. At least I tried and I can go back to do something. Maybe they don't take me back, but I have a track record of six years doing that. Yeah. Uh, and I think about, I was quite good in that. I can go somewhere else, do the same thing. Uh, so why, why not take the chance? Why, why not take the chance? Uh, like, uh, and there was one speech of, oh, I forgot the name of the, the guy who plays the role of, um, I also forgot the movie now. Um, under the dome, uh, where, um, oh shit, like what's the movie called? Where, where they, where he lives, uh, he grows up under Truman Show. Um, Truman Show yes. Yeah. How is the main character called? Truman. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. Yeah, but definitely he gave a speech and I just saw that in the three weeks and that speech really um, uh, stuck with me. And he's, he told this, this story about his conservative father who was, uh, I think, an accountant or something. And he just like was an accountant and he failed as an accountant because his company was closing down or his branch was closing down or something like he did a great job but his company was just closing down. And so he had uh, no chance of, of, of doing that. And his, co his family all of a sudden were um, basically uh, in a lot of financial struggles. Uh, and then he said a sentence is like, you, you can fail in something you don't love. So why not take a chance on something you actually like? Like why, <laughs> why not do the thing that you actually uh, want to do? So that was basically, wow. uh, to, to answer your question, my uh, decision-making tree, <laughs> yeah. why, why I did that. It was more emotional. I have to do that. Uh, I don't care about the pros and the cons. I, I was not making lists and, and thinking about opportunity costs. I was just going emotionally and say like, I have to do this now. Wow, that's incredible! It takes it takes a lot of courage. That's and that's such a it's great. I mean, your podcast is so good. I I, I was going to ask you too. Like, I don't understand how you do it. I mean, you you're putting out so many episodes and they're so well done. And um, you know, the captions on Spotify and the YouTube and the da, 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 like it's incredible how how you get it out. But yeah, you're full time, right? So you're spending your you're spending all your time on it. Yeah, because you're all in. Yeah, it's. Uh, Wow. Good for you. It's, That's so awesome, uh, man. It, it's around 60 hours per week. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I bet it is. Yeah. Good for you. Well, but I'm, yeah, maybe I do to make that, uh, story to, to give the story happy. end. Uh, I recently reach, reached, um, uh, a higher salary. I mean, it's now a revenue stream, not on salary, but who cares how, whatever, it, how yeah. it's called a uh, higher salary than I had before at the company. And that's just, um, what is it? 10 months or eight months after I quit. So that that's uh, pretty, pretty freaking nice. <laughs> wow. Good for you. Yeah. I think about that too. Sometimes like I'm doing a job that I hate for <laughs> however many hours a week and I'm doing a good job at it. Like, yeah, I mean, I just got a, I actually just got laid off from my job and then I used a recruiter and now I have, I'm starting at a new job next week. <laughs> so it's, case in point. But anyway, my point is, is I got a letter of recommendation. So I'm, I'm th doing a job that I don't like so well <laughs> that I got a letter of recommendation, right? So how good would I do if I could just focus in on Bitcoin every day? Something I love and I can't stop blabbering about to all my friends and my family and shit posting online and writing articles and all that stuff. Yeah. If you could, if I could focus on one thing that I really love, then yeah, it's, uh, and I guess, yeah, it's beautiful, and I guess man. for, I guess for people that um trying to figure that out, uh, you have to see like, okay, what do you want to do? And, and how do you want to do it? It's like, um, if you want to work in, in Bitcoin, uh, you can still do this in, in, in a normal, uh, work environment, in a normal, like, uh, fiat job kind of thing, because there are a lot of big companies, uh, in, even inside of Bitcoin. I mean, if you go Bitcoin only company, that's a little bit more adventurous and a little bit more startup y, but uh, I can definitely recommend that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but it, it, uh, it requires a little bit more. More of an entrepreneurial spirit uh, but you can still have like your nine to five job and and because a lot of people want that a lot of people don't want the headache and and the, the stress uh, related to being solo or being a founder or something like that i think most people actually don't want that so uh th there's there's like this one thing of like okay, the side of like 
do, do you actually want to do your own thing and do you actually want to try that and, and be an entrepreneur and, and start something and, and fight for your revenue and, and not have an automatic salary every month, which changed a lot in my brain, like right. <laughs> for going from an automatic good salary to, uh, I have to actually work towards that revenue right. every uh, month. No, uh, no days off. That, that, It's just going in your that, head all the time. Right. It, it changes like it changes how you spend money. It literally changes how you spend money because when you don't know for, for certain that next month there will come money and like, I don't know how it's, it, it is where in Sweden, but it probably the same thing in Austria. Uh, even if they lay you off, they at least have to pay, pay you three months and sometimes like even like half a year, they have to pay you the full salary. Um, so I, there's always this, security of like i can spend money now because i at least get three more months even right. if they lay me off and there's no laying off in in in, in the in the vision but if if you have like uh, uh you 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 have like and i have this like all three four months because i have like short-term contracts with all my uh, partners mm -hmm. and i was like okay if i don't get them and there's one month coming up it was in november it was the same thing again uh, they all um um, um prolong their the contracts but uh before that month you go in and like okay if if they all say no to my proposal then i don't have an income anymore <laughs> <laughs> like, right. like, if, if this all breaks down, like, yeah, it, and that, that yeah. changes something for you. Yeah. Well, that, that that's your whole story is so inspiring. And one thing that comes to mind and the way that, that I think about, you know, how you said you didn't really evaluate it too long. You just went all in kind of passion process. And I respect that so much. I'm more like in the analytical phase and this, oh, I think about this so often. Have you seen this clip from uh, Joe Rogan? I don't, I don't know who the guest was, but he was talking about this concept of most men live and live lives of quiet desperation. Did you see that? Oh no, but uh, I, I, I agree with that sentence already. Yeah. yeah. So his, his thing is like, he's like, right now we're, we're on a podcast and right now me and you are on a podcast and there's someone sitting on a spreadsheet, you know, tallying up widgets and making a progress report or a schedule or whatever. And they don't want to be doing it. They wish they were, they owned a sailboat or they did something that they're passionate about. They're living a life of quiet desperation. They're just getting their job done because they have a mortgage and they have a family and they have a car payment insurance. They, they feel like they can't get out because the money at the end of the month goes and there's no space to leave. So they just live their whole life doing a job that they don't like. And I feel like when I heard that clip, I was listening to that podcast on a spreadsheet. You know what I mean? I was like, oh my God, that's me. And then he says, what you need to do is you just need to realize you effed up. You got yourself into this situation. You made a mistake. So I'm like in that phase right now, I've realized that I've made a mistake. You've made a mistake, he said. And what you need to do is you need to build yourself a window. So you need to spend all your days figuring out how much, how you can, how you can accumulate enough money to build yourself like a three month or six month window where all of your, all of your expenses are paid. You're going to be okay. Your family's going to be okay. And then you need to spend all your waking hours before or after work, making a plan and finding whatever you want to do and pouring yourself into that thing. And when that window comes and you have enough money, you execute it with everything you have. And that's the only way to exit the life of quiet desperation. So the way I think about it is right now, if I just went out on my own and just tried, tried to look for work, I don't have an, like, whatever. I want to get to a certain like stacking goal before I go and build myself that window. So I don't know when that's going to be, but right now I'm like in the planning phase. So I'm going to build myself a window. I'm going to find what I want to do, whatever creative art form, whether it's a podcast or articles, or I don't know, I'm still don't really know what I want, but I'm building myself. Or I'm directing my life towards that window. And then when it, when the day comes, I'm going to go all in just like you. I'm so inspired, man. Your, your podcast is, is awesome. And uh, yeah, you deserve everything that you, that you have. It's great. Good for you. 
Uh, thank you so much. I uh, appreciate it. And then let's, uh, whenever this window comes, then let's get uh, get you back on, on on the podcast and see how how it went afterwards. Uh, would be really, I think it. it I think those could be the stories uh, that are also really inspiring for for people, even outside. Like I committed to this podcast to do it my whole life, uh, and uh, I will fully do that podcast my whole life. Not just like ah, like once a week, maybe uh, if I'm like okay, no, no, like fully committed to this podcast. Um, and I just want to collect the truth in in the world and right now i think there's nothing else i can focus my time on than bitcoin so i think the next like three five years the main focus of the podcast will be bitcoin but at some point bitcoin will be boring because everyone has bitcoin everyone understands bitcoin sure. it will be the this uh, main reserve of the of, of the world uh, and then it's like oh do you have a bitcoin podcast like why do you keep talking about it that that's boring we have like uh spaceships now flying around. right like, like i don't know what's happening like having a podcast yeah. about the internet it's like yeah everybody has the internet whatever who cares yeah like <laughs> like oh let's talk today about the tcp ip <laughs> protocol <laughs> yeah exactly there'll be a day but i think that day's over uh, a ways away yet so you yeah, should be true. able to get out some some episodes but i um I, i've also come across this funny you say that uh about discipline you you are committed to your art form of getting podcasts out have you heard of the book um the war of art by stephen pressfield the war of art the art of war you mean well there's the art of well, war the... by sun Tzu, right but this is the war of art oh um, actually i don't know about that yeah so this book i i I keep talking about Joe Rogan, but he used to give out in his early episodes, he'd give out to all these comedians, this book, like he had a stack of them and we'd give them out to all these comedian friends. And, uh, I recently did like got the audio book and I've gone through it a few times and it's gotta be one of the best books I've ever writ read. It's, uh, it's really changed my perspective. So he has like a few different ideas. Okay. So if you are an artist and it doesn't mean like, doesn't have to be like drawing or painting it can be anything. Bitcoin podcast is an art form right a pod making a podcast it's like creating a business cr creating something the art of creation let's just say it that way in any in the pursuit of creating something there are there are a couple things so one he talks about um what he calls resistance so let's say i want to uh i want to you know write an article a bitcoin article and publish it on my sub stack when I, I know that every day I should wake up, pour a cup of coffee, and I should sit down and write for one hour and then post it on Substack. That's my goal, right? I've committed to that. Resistance is, oh, no, you should just go to the store. Oh, yeah, you should just lay on the couch with your wife. Oh, but the dog needs, needs to be taken out. The dog needs to be played with. Oh, you should do this. You should do that. He describes the, the, the resistance as like something equivalent to like gravity it is a an always it's like a pressure on your life that is constantly trying to distract you or pull you away from your art and i'm sure you, ex you experience that all the time as a, as an entrepreneur like to stay focused as you do which is so amazing that you just like consistently pump it out every week every day it seems like every day you put out a podcast which i want to ask you how you do that because it's incredible but um, yeah, it's every day Every day. Yeah. I'd like to talk to you even offline of how, how you even do that. But um, he's saying, okay, you need to constantly and consciously fight resistance in your life and in your craft. So that's number one. Okay. The second is he describes um, something as um, he, he goes into like a lot of like Greek mythology and stuff, but he has this, this entity that he calls the muse and the muse is like a fictional entity and like unseeable, like you can't see it. You, what what it's doing is it's con it's looking at your life, and what it needs is you need to do the work, and like provide an offering to the muse, and you are rewarded with creativity, like the bounty of your art, right? So if you every day sit down and you start, you say nine a.m. I'm gonna pour a cup of coffee. I'm gonna start writing you're going to write a shit article. And that's, my, that's where I'm at right now. I'm just, I'm writing just, I'm just writing. And it's like, I don't know what I'm writing. I'm not a good writer. I'm just writing. And then the next day you do the same thing, pour a cup of coffee, start writing over time. 
after a week, after a month, after six months, after a year, you're going to write a damn good article. And the idea is, is since you are offering that discipline, hard work and time to the muse, you are rewarded with, with creativity. Like creativity comes out of the ether. It's like, where did, uh, where did Picasso's painting ideas for paintings come from? Where did the, the, the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel come from? And Stephen, Stephen Pressfield is saying, you are rewarded. Like the, like the artist is rewarded from the muse, from the hard work and dedication that they put into the craft. Right? And I think this is a mind-blowing concept because we're, we're in a day and age where we have our phone pinging every, time, every five minutes. They're designed to ping and vibrate and... Everybody is distracted constantly. And then you look around and architecture is like just like a bunch of boxes. And, you know, people aren't even performing, like being paid to do art. They're not, they're not focusing on something creative. I'm doing something that's just on a spreadsheet. There's zero creativity. I'm, I was trained to do something non-creative for a fiat wage. I was just put through the ringer and now I'm producing be more efficient, produce. It's like if I direct my energy and I offer, I fight resistance and I offer my discipline, my intention to the muse, I don't, what might come out of me? I, I said to my wife, I said, if I had a canvas in front of me after 10 years of working on a spreadsheet and teams meetings, all this BS, what would I paint? I, I don't even know. If I had to write a song, what would I write? And that was like a really sobering feeling recently, like that the creativity has been like drained from my body for what some corporation to hit their profit margins or whatever, to make the stock go up, make number go up on their stock. It's like, yeah, I need it. Not only do I need to find something that I'm interested in Bitcoin, but for like spiritually as a person, we are being drained. The fiat system is draining us of our creativity. And that is resistance in itself. And we need to fight that resistance. So we talk about what's going to happen after Bitcoin. It's like in the jobs market, it's like, well, maybe people will have more time to be more creative and maybe architecture will flourish and maybe art will flourish. And we can see that through gold, like gold standard eras where architecture is much better. Like this is a common trope on, on, um, uh, on Twitter, right? Oh, look at the architecture from the, this uh, gold stand, standard period. It's like, yeah, because they didn't have to fight like this pressure of resistance of their money losing value. They had time to be more creative and focus on a craft for their whole life every day. Society just flourishes. Anyway, sorry for my rant, but it's uh, just really blown my mind recently. So I wanted to share that. That's beautiful. Yeah. That's beautiful. I love it. It's, 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 <sighs> It, it's so true. Like, it's really hard to stay focused. <laughs> I have to say, yeah. um, because when you work, you kind of have to stay focused anyways. Like you have this work environment, there's this office, there are those people, there are those deadlines, there are those, uh, uh monthly reviews, weekly reviews, like there are all those infrastructures and processes, uh, and boundaries built into that. Uh, if you're an employee, you're very likely to like just stay motivated because you are in a, in like a line where it's easy to work. But what happens when there are no guardrails? There's, there's not no support structure for you. There's just like you yourself <laughs> and, and, right. and, and, and I. So that, that becomes very difficult. And I struggle with that a lot. Uh, but what helped me is building those support structures just for myself, like building like, okay, like I want to push a podcast every day. So what is the minimum amount of work I have to do? Okay. Then I stand up in the morning, 5 a.m. every day. And the first thing I do is that minimum amount of work that I have to do. And I'm usually done with that at 8 a.m. Then I, uh, right now I have the, the thing where I go after that to do the calisthenics park workout, then come back, eat something, uh, first, uh, first, um, um, breakfast. And then I go again till, uh, till midday eat something then i go again so it's like wow. i actually uh usually um 
outdo my minimum. Uh, and sometimes, for example, this week is a really hard week because I had to pump up my minimum by two two x because next week I'm the whole week in El Salvador and I just assume that I don't have time the whole week to work. I probably have some time to, to work there also and I probably have to work a little bit there, but I just assume that I don't have work. So I have to pre-work everything <laughs> for, for next week to make this week possible. Um, so uh, my daily minimum is 2x higher and higher and I just see how this is fucking with my mind right <laughs> how, how this this little bit higher is just like oh like oh oh that's hard uh oh no i have to relax no i sh should not go too too hard oh no like uh, let's watch the election because i have to do that because yeah whatever so like you you come up with all those excuses uh, do not go hard but then uh the best working days is where i have a really tight schedule and i just worked it the whole damn time like i, I just like stand up at five and, and work till eight uh p.m and, and then it's like and then i look back at the day i'm like oh man i i didn't even look at my phone like <laughs> i didn't even wow. have the time to scroll on instagram i didn't even have the time to uh do to, to mess around because i had the whole time uh, packed with work and to be honest um you need both like you need those days where you just like pack everything and you just go and then uh, maybe it's good to have like one day every once in a while to, to lay a little bit low and have those cre creative ideas and and think of like oh like oh i could do that uh but um you should not <laughs> you should not only have those days where you're just like laying and like uh procrastinating but there is some value also in procrastinating so i i, I do also want to note that yeah well like all of those things you mentioned are resistance and we were talking about monetary premium earlier like there has been a monetary premium put on our attention so um there's literally a company out there saying like, how can we steal your, your attention and put it on our product, right? Your, your focus has been commoditized, right? So it, that's a form of resistance. That's pretty sick. And, you know, we've seen all these uh, different documentaries where they're like, you know, they're attacking your brainstem. They're, they're literally figuring out what colors and what songs and whatever on TikTok that stimulates your brain in a way. And then next thing you know, you lose like two hours of your life, of your focus, right? And just to just to operate a podcast, which is like digital, obviously, but then also have to like disconnect digitally must be like a weird kind of line to draw. Because yeah, like you said, I need to be informed about the election, but I don't need to be watching three hours of it right like how do you do that it's it's really hard because um okay twitter is really good in stealing my attention because twitter knows really good what i like uh so i find myself like editing the description of a podcast uh and then i have to fill in the contact uh of of my guest and then i go on there x.com open the website oh what pops up interesting interesting 10 minutes later, I'm like, wait, why am I on X scrolling? Well, right. Why am I doing that? And then it's like, oh, yeah, I, I wanted to find the guest's uh, contact URL so I can put it in the description as I every day do. Uh, but then uh, I find guardrails around that. So instead of going to x.com, I go to uh, pro.x.com where I can define how X looks and then I only get into my messages. And my messages are not as destructive as the for you page. So ah, I go in there okay. and search a name and go directly on his profile, copy the URL and put it in the description. So I just try to analyze where I get distracted because I 100% do. I'm, I'm, I'm not David Goggins. Right. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I'm, I'm so sorry. I'm not. So, uh, I have to put up guardrails for myself to stay focused, to stay to keep that focus for as long as possible. And I like to just like have go times and lay times where like those are the times I just like go as hard as possible and I'm really focused working. And then I have like lay times where I just lay on the couch and do tomb scrolling. But there's an associated time where I'm like, okay, 
the next 30 minutes, I just lay there. Either I don't do anything or I watch something on Netflix or I play chess. I really like playing chess on my phone. That's also something that distracts me a lot. Uh, and I keep telling me that's a good thing, but I don't think that's a good thing uh, to, to play chess all the time <laughs> when, when you're not a professional chess player. Uh, but yeah, like I, I, I like... I like when I define, okay, where is my go time where I don't want to be distracted and where is my lay time where it's okay to be on uh, chess.com playing uh, till, the, uh, till, till the, the time is up. <laughs> right. Yeah. It's, it sounds like you have just like full control over your time. And I mean, that, that's like a, a value of all Bitcoiners. Like our time is valuable. It is Time is scarce. Bitcoin is scarce. It's like, Therefore, if time is scarce, then I need to control it because I value it, right? So you're blocking so out you're blocking times, out. like in a disciplined fashion, to take care of your craft, and that's impressive. That's one of the most most people it, can't do that, right? It, it's it's something I, I really want to notice here because uh, you said before with gravity, and and that's so true. Like it's it's not like you figure it once out and all of a sudden it's good. No, you, and you have to keep fighting. <laughs> the, yeah. the distractions uh, will keep coming, and the 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 better you get, uh, like uh, the the better you get in fighting distractions, the the better I feel like the distractions get. <laughs> right. Yeah. yeah. Uh, it, 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 the distractions come bigger, uh, and they get better uh, in in distracting you, and and different things distract you, but they are still distractions, uh, and uh, opportunities arise, and and. And, uh, and it's like, oh, like, should I do this? No, 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 no. <laughs> stay, stay fucking focused. Like, like this is this is where you should be, and that that that's where the thing is. And uh, saying no to things, and 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 saying, uh, hey, I'm I'm sticking with that, and I committed to that. That's super hard. Like, that. <laughs> I struggle with that to be honest. Uh, but uh, the discipline to. Like that's the one thing you have to be disciplined about um, not just wasting your time with like doom scrolling on Instagram. That's an obvious one. You nine, 99% uh, chance you wasted your time. Uh, but then there's also opportunities coming and like, hey, uh, I want to meet you for coffee. I have an interesting idea. Okay, do you go? Do you go to that coffee? Because if you go to that coffee, that takes you out of the work mode, right. uh, and that might ruin your whole day. Right. The, the resistance <laughs> it, becomes it, more sophisticated. Yeah. Right. It's like more uh, temp, more temptation. Like, oh yeah, like oh, I should go see that friend. Like, you know that you know social interaction is good for you, and like you start convincing yourself, like, oh yeah, I need this. Right. It's like no, you need to work on your craft. Right. And <laughs> you need to offer this discipline to get the the results from the muse, right? Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's crazy. It's crazy, but uh, good for Absolutely, you for fighting, yeah. uh, for fighting, yeah, for fighting, fighting a good fight. It's obviously, fight. Uh, obviously resulted in a great podcast. So, thank you so much. Yeah, it's uh, it's it, it's a it's a great pleasure doing that, and it keeps me it keeps me it keeps me accountable because uh, I have. Uh, a lot of people that would probably be at least DMing me or writing me if all of a sudden, for some reason, one day the podcast is not coming out <laughs> because I have been so consistent every day, Monday to Sunday, every day for months now. Uh, and this is my 305th episode. So I'm cracking on the like one year, uh, one year long, uh, being every day on. Uh, so I have this public accountability, which is amazing, uh, uh, when you have a podcast because like everyone can hold you accountable to that. And, I will not fail. Like, like there is a podcast episode coming out every day, 2 p.m. GMT plus one or GMT plus plus two. <laughs> Depends on if it's summertime or winter's time. <laughs> wow. And, people will message uh, you like if you if you didn't, people would be like, Are you okay messaging you? Are you okay? Did something okay. happen? <laughs> I, I think I think so, actually. Like uh, I think if if uh, if I miss a whole day, uh there might be something like one, two people that 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 watch it every day. Uh maybe like a few more that watch it every day, probably there are like a good amount of people. I mean there are probably way more than that, like because there are around fifty to 50,000 to 100,000 people watching every month. Uh, so on a daily basis, there are probably uh, a few hundred, maybe 
maybe even close to a thousand, but probably a few hundred that watch every day or close to every day. Uh, so uh, some of them would definitely DM me. And after a week, if I let out a whole week, then I think my, my inbox is full. <laughs> <laughs> so like, like, what was it like when you first started figuring out like what kind of equipment, what kind of software programs, like do you use AI to, to uh, edit? Like what was it like going through and figuring out, cause it's really polished. Like it seems like you have really good equipment. The audio is good. Like um, you, like you said, you're spinning them out every, every day and the, the quality is so high. I, I, I'm just like interested in like, how did you figure out the best uh, equipment setup? Uh, a lot of YouTube watching, <laughs> yeah, yeah, and 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 just testing. And I, I'm I'm kind of obsessed with not only bringing out the quantity every day, but also polishing it up and making it better. And I think the best learning I have from all that that you can apply to everything is um, start with just what you have, like, like start with, with whatever you can do. Uh, and when you look at my first episode, it's, uh, completely different to my episode that to this episode that is currently out. Uh, it's, it's completely different. And what I did every time I improved something, I made sure that the improvement is something stackable. Like I don't improve my episode if it's just for one episode. Uh, I had the even suggestions from guests and like, hey, can you do that? Hey, can you do that? Uh, for example, hey, can you do B-roll for me? Can you do like in the podcast uh, when I talk about a topic, uh, p put that picture in? And I said like, no, uh, it's too much time right now, and I can I could I could only do it for you, and I could not stack that. Uh, improvement of the bit of the podcast so i will not implement it so every improvement that comes to the podcast is stacked and then comes to every podcast after that till i decide there might be something better right. uh, so everything that i improve is stacked on top of each other and then what happens after like 100 or 200 episodes uh you have all those small stacks that every time you release something you better and better and better and better and then you look like 100 episodes back and you're like oh like there has a lot of development going but you didn't notice it because every time it got a little bit better it's just like a, a very small detail that i maybe changed and there are some episodes that i don't change anything right <laughs> so frankly like there, there are some episodes that don't uh, change anything so i think to to keep it generalized and we can go in detail uh, if you want to but to keep it generalized I, I try to find um, improvements that make sense and then I can stack onto all the other things I already do and keep it as efficient and simple as possible because I do a lot of work <laughs> to do one podcast per day. Uh, and if it's too complicated, I don't do it. Uh, there's a lot of things that, for example, right now I do switch between a two uh, split screen and the full screen. Mm -hmm. And I didn't do that from the beginning. Why do I do it now? Because now AI does it for me. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I didn't. AI uh, feature was enabled on Riverside, and I just had to click a button. And since then, every episode is a little bit more intact uh, with a little bit more interactions. So and that's how I right. try. I think and stackable. That's yeah. that's so. I don't try to like figure out how to do the next podcast episode better. How to try to figure out like how to do all the episodes from now on a little bit better and stack those on top of it. I think that's the, the biggest learning uh, I had so far. And I think that's actually um, applicable probably for everything you do. I think th there's nothing you, like, just like get a little bit better uh, with whatever you do uh, and try to implement something that uh, will also be relevant in like a half a year or year and, and something like that. So uh, that, that that's, I hope that's, that's, I hope that is valuable. <laughs> no, that's, that's, uh, I, I totally understand it. It's what comes to mind is when people say, Oh, I'm, I'm starting this new diet or this fitness challenge. It's like, well, that is completely unsustainable and you're going to last uh, however long it's a three week challenge. After that, you're going to go back to the same stuff that you're doing before and probably put, put the weight back on or, you know, whatever. So yeah, that's, I think that's uh, wise advice. Just, just slow improvements. Like, Oh, I bought new microphones. Like the next episode, you're going to use the same microphone. It's like, 
the next, I have an editing software. Or I, like you said, I'm using AI for the split screen. Well, that's just one click or it's automatic, even automate it. And then it just keeps building on itself. Now oh, that's smart. It's really smart. Ab absolutely. Perfect. But yeah, this podcast has been, <laughs> has been going very long actually already. <laughs> yeah. <that's laughs> I didn't even notice it that we're already uh, uh, so far in. I think the, the, honestly, the conversations the last two, three weeks, um has been amazing uh, i feel like i'm i'm coming into a whole new podcast recording flow like i really get into this conversation um so that that's great i hope you also uh, enjoyed it um i have one question uh, that i always ask my guests and this is the question what can we learn from you besides bitcoin and maybe besides all the things that we already talked about <laughs> yeah sure um i've been thinking about this a lot and uh I don't know, maybe just my, my upbringing. Like I was, um, I was born in, uh, in Edmonton, Alberta and, uh, grew up in like Northern Alberta, kind of in a small oil, oil and gas and forestry town. And, uh, yeah, my, my father actually runs, um, uh, a business that is like with hunting and fishing. Like he's a, he's an outfitter. So we have like clients come and come hunting from, from the States. And, and I was a guide for him you know whole life before i moved to sweden I, I would do that like on different hunting seasons so we'd take like white-tailed deer hunters out or black bear hunters out and and uh yeah so it's it's been a really uh nice education like since i was a little boy like getting to interact with like people from another country and you know they're they're uh operating in a different currency and they're uh you know, I was able to learn that, you know, the world isn't so small. The world is a big place and it's not so scary. And you can, you can travel and see the world and interact with other cultures and other people. And, um, and then the hunting side is a lot of proof of work, you know, to, to be able to go out and hunt and, and, and get your targeted animal that you want. That It takes a lot of work and you're fighting conditions and, and, uh, all kind of things. So it's a, yeah, same thing. You got to put the discipline in, put hard work in, upgrade your skills, and then eventually it pays off. So that's been a kind of like a value system that I've had for a long time. And, and it's kind of led me to the path where I am now. So I love that. That's, uh, that's, that's pretty, and I think it really fits nicely to, to the episode to, uh, we, we did, uh, which, um, it's, <laughs> uh, people, um, outside of Bitcoin, when uh, I talk about the podcast and I say to them, I do it daily, uh, because first of all, like when I say daily, most people think that I do it Monday to Friday. Mm, yeah. <laughs> I also do Saturday, Sunday. Mm -hmm. Um, but they keep asking me like, Oh, is, is there so much to discuss on, on Bitcoin? And I was like, <laughs> first of all, like, yes. <laughs> and, and second of all, um, the Bitcoin community really likes to dive deep into everything. I did a whole episode around parenting where we did not even talk about Bitcoin wow. uh, with Lisa Huff. And it was an amazing episode and people loved it also. Like the, the average food duration and all the statistics that I get, gather from every podcast, the, the same as, as every time, like people enjoyed it. Uh, so I think uh, the Bitcoin community is a special one where you can have a Bitcoin podcast and talk about everything else too, <laughs> wow. like, which is amazing. What an education uh, the, the had, hey? just, uh, just getting to meet all these interesting people. That's, that's really cool. I'm, uh, I'm kind of in a Bitcoin university and I get paid for it. That's how I see it. Wow. <laughs> Living the dream. <laughs> I'm trying to live in the dream uh, uh, as much as I can. Yeah, um, yeah, perfect. Then uh, we have entered into the podcast where the previous guest is asking a question for the next guest without knowing who the next guest um, actually is. And the question is very uh, Bitcoin and scaling. Uh, like, do you run a self-custodial lightning node? And if not, why? Um, I, I guess I'm just not at that uh that level of like tech, tech, technically I just, I don't run one. Every time I, I, uh, I'm asked about, uh, do you run a node? I always sh with shame have to say no. So it's on my list. Um, I want to get a node running before Christmas. That's my goal. So a, a lightning node or Not a lightning are you also talking just, about just, Bitcoin? just a regular node. I need to get one going before Christmas. So it's a guilt, guilty thing that's on my mind all the time. So it's, uh, I have to do that. 
I mean, it, it has some benefits. Like uh, it, it's it's great how the incentive structure also in Bitcoin works because if you run a full node, obviously you also contribute to the decentralization of Bitcoin, but you also have your own um, uh, incentives to do so uh, with privacy and other things uh, in, in, in mind. So uh, I think it's a, it, it's a great thing. And um, I always tell people, at least try it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, like I, right now, uh, there's no active node running in, in my home, uh, but there will come uh, again and i already tried it so like uh, i think the the education as, especially as we do it uh, early bitcoiners i think we we kind of have to do uh but uh the, the, i'm not in the camp that says oh you have to run a bitcoin node because you're a bitcoiner no like if if that's true then bitcoin is doomed to fail like if right. if the incentive structure is not good enough to to have a decentralized Bitcoin node operation, um, then 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 it will not succeed. But it will succeed because the in incentive structure is there, and and people really like to run nodes. So like uh, that's that's kind of my, <laughs> my my take on that. So like you don't have to run a node if you don't want. You can just stack. Like there's nothing wrong with that. Yeah, that's that's always like my when I get really motivated, I'm, okay, I'm going to go and, you know, buy like a used laptop or get one on Amazon. I'm going to do this and install Linux and do all this stuff. And then it's just like, yeah, well, the price just dipped. <laughs> maybe I should just, maybe I should just stack. <laughs> and, then, and then it's just like smash buy. It's like, okay, well, there goes my, my laptop, Amazon, Amazon purchase or whatever, or my, whatever kind of node that people are selling online or whatever. So yeah, it's my, uh, it's a, it's shameful that I, I don't, but, that's my honest answer. I don't run one because maybe I'm too cheap and I just want to stack that <laughs> right now. I, I don't think I, I don't think it's it's shameful, uh, but uh, I, I I do think you you. I mean, you can even try it like on on your laptop that you have, uh, and and then just like like do it there as, as like an educational thing. Uh, but yeah, it's it's definitely something. I, I don't I don't think it's it's shameful. Like it, it, if it would be shameful, I think it would be. I think it would be bad for the Bitcoin community overall if that would be obligatory. So like if that's like really something, uh, and 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 sometimes we are too toxic about stuff. Yeah, <laughs> yeah like, it's on the list. It's I'm on gonna the get list. It done, so. I have, a, I have a goal before Christmas. Goal before so. Christmas so. Perfect. Then uh, we, we can hold you accountable uh, when we have you a second time on the podcast. And then I'll ask you again, did you install the note? Please do. Please, <laughs> do. Please do. I can't wait. I can't wait to have another conversation. This has been really fun. So thanks for having me on, Robin. I really appreciate it. Perfect. And yeah, thank you so much for, for taking the time. Uh, before I let you go, where can people find you? Yeah, you can just find me on, uh, find me on X or Twitter at bitcoiner with an eight instead of a b um, my handle is fiat is worthless i also uh, just started a sub stack i'm gonna try publishing some articles on there um, but yeah just find me on twitter perfect i put the uh, uh, twitter link as <laughs> described before always in the description so people can fin find it uh, thank you so much for uh, spending the time uh, with us here and also thank you so much for everyone that's watching and listening for joining us today as always i'll be back tomorrow with another episode bye bye